Can, can people hear me? Yeah, now great, great. So, good afternoon and welcome to our uh, Rick Three faculty series. Uh, my name is Jose David Saldivar, and I'm the director of the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, and also the, uh, a professor in the Department of Comparative Literature. I'm also here to, uh, to represent, uh, you know, Hazel uh, Marcus and our associate director, Mariam Hamadani, who couldn't be here today. Um, I'm delighted to see all of you today on this rainy, wonderful day at Stanford. And we don't get often hear thunderstorms, but it's great. Um, and to welcome you to our last Rick Three faculty series for the year. And uh, this is my last one as well, since my term is up. And we've, uh, you know, it's had wonderful speakers throughout the past three years, and I'm sure we're going to have a wonderful talk today. To introduce our distinguished speaker this afternoon, uh, Professor David Fitzgerald, I'd like to ask my colleague Tomas Jimenez to come and do the honors. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, for the first time ever, David Fitzgerald has been thanked for bringing the rain from San Diego. Um, uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker, David Fitzgerald. Uh, never before have I had to, uh, there's a lot of nevers, revise uh, an introduction so rapidly. You might have noticed that our speaker today was out in the hallway just about five minutes ago on the phone, and it turns out he had gotten a call from, what is the name of the committee, David? The Final Authority. The Final Authority <laughs> at UC San Diego, where he is now a full professor. <laughs> in the Department of Sociology uh, as of July 1st, but given that the final authority has given the final word, I will introduce David as a full professor of sociology at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, he is also the director of the Center for Comparative, uh, excuse me, Center for Comparative Studies, Center for Comparative Immigration Studies, There's a lot of comparisons happening here, um, where he has, uh, along with John Scrutney, built that center into a real international uh, powerhouse in terms of the study of migration. Um, I first came to know David when I was in graduate school. We finished the same year, uh, and I, every year that I was in graduate school, um, asked my advisor to nominate my papers for the student paper awards, and I never won, and there was one reason why I never won, and, and, he's, and he's sitting right here. This David Fitzgerald guy would win every year, and I thought, who is this guy? And fortunately, a couple of years after um, we both graduated, I, I got to know exactly who he is um, because he joined me on the faculty at UC San Diego, uh, and um, that is one of the best moves that that department has made in a very, very long time. Um, David's work focuses on international migration, migration policy, race, uh, nationhood, among other things. He is um, perhaps best known for his first book, which I am holding in my hand right here, called The Nation of Emigrants, uh, which looks at how Mexico has managed uh, the massive emigration from that country, mostly to the United States, over the last 100 years. And David uh, flips the script, as the, as the kids often say. Uh, instead of asking how a nation that receives immigrants like the United States is shaped by the immigrants who come, and in particular in terms of its sense of nationhood, David asks, what does it mean when lots of immigrants leave a place, and how does a country kind of come to terms with, uh, with the fact that so many people are leaving? Uh, it is a brilliant uh, historical sociological account, as Anna Minion will tell you. You. She's, uh, I think, David's number one fan. Um, but David is here to talk about his second book. And before I say anything about his second book, and he will say lots about his second book, uh, I should also mention that, that uh, I wanted to slide this in the, into my introduction somehow, that uh, in addition to doing all of the administration work, to doing top-notch scholarship, um, David is also perhaps the only sociologist I know who has been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize uh, in photography. David is also a, a former photojournalist for the LA Times. And if you have coffee with him this afternoon, you should ask him. He has lots of great war stories about being a photojournalist for the LA Times. Um, but David's most recent book, which uh, has just come out from uh, Harvard University Press and is available for purchase out there. And I think I will speak for David when I say that he is happy to sign it if you'd like him to do so. I got mine signed today. Um, 
takes a look at immigration policy in the Americas and the way in which race has been used by various countries as a justification for excluding some migrants and including others. And I won't say too much more about it because he's going to say lots about it. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming David Fitzgerald. <clears throat> Well, thanks very much for the, uh, the warm introduction. As I was uh, c coming in from the airport last night, I was reflecting on the fact. reflecting on the fact that there's really no more relevant place to give this talk, for better or for worse, than Stanford University. And I was going back and looking at the inaugural address to the California legislature made by Governor Leland uh, Stanford in 1862, and in the fourth paragraph of his remarks, in the very beginning of his remarks, he called for any constitutional action that would end immigration of the, quote, Asiatic peoples who were inferior, who were depraved, who were this fundamental threat to the state of California. And of course, he later changed his mind and went on to become instrumental in the recruitment of uh, Asian workers on the railroads. But it's, it's really in that kind of discussion, right here in California, this is ground zero, and it always has been ground zero, uh, for discussions of selecting uh, immigrants and what are the grounds on which immigrants are, are selected. So the project that, um, I don't know if there is a technical person who could think about that, that, that issue, okay. So the, the, the project today is, is aimed at trying to understand what is the empirical relationship between liberal democracy on the one hand and racism on the other. Immigration and nationality policy are strategic sites in order to be able to understand this connection because it's in these kinds of policies that policymakers are deciding who is morally worthy, who adds economic value, all sorts of decisions about who should be uh, a neighbor, and in the case of nationality, who should be a fellow citizen, who should, part, who, who should form a part of the, um, of the polity. So many people have, have thought about this issue at a, at a philosophical level, and while we're interested in that, the value that we hope to add is to see, well, what is the relationship empirically through this, this site of immigration and nationality law. So there's a long-standing body of literature that claims that there's something fundamentally incompatible about um, liberal democracy on the one hand and, and racism on the other. Uh, so this goes back to the scholarship of people like um, John Hyam, the, the, the historian of nativism in the U.S., who has made this argument very explicitly. More recently, it's been repeated by the sociologist Christian Jopke, also by the American uh, political scientist Gary Freeman, who say that it's the liberalness of states, it's the exigencies of liberalness as such, to quote Jopke on this question, that shows why governments of Places like the United States, other rich liberal democratic countries, have ended their explicit selection of immigrants based on, on racial criteria. So while we wish that the world worked that way, and that is, is comfortable for our own uh, political views, we find that empirically that argument is exactly wrong. So against those kinds of claims, we argue that uh, liberalism as a, an ideology and democracy as a particular way of organizing politics, that they have actually uh, tended to promote racist immigration policies. Now, to be clear, we're not arguing that there's a one-to-one -one relationship or that there's an iron law of history that those things have to come together. Uh, but we do say that there is uh, an, an elective affinity, to use the, the term of, of Goethe, um, but, but between those, those different ideas. And unless there's something else that interferes, and we will identify what that is, um, that, that those, those things have, have often come together and actually promoted those, those, those racist policies. <clears throat> 
So our, our second argument is that against the existing uh, historiography, which makes the argument that uh, the end of these kinds of policies started in North America and then spread through other primarily Anglophone settler societies, that actually these policies began um, in the global south. So the demise of explicit racial selection began in various countries of the global south, sort of against the, the normal flow of political gravity. And that what really drove the end of these policies was not so much the story that we're typically told in the United States, which is that 1965 was the result of the US civil rights movement. Yes, that was relevant, but fundamentally, this was about something much, much deeper and much, much more widespread, uh, which had to do with a set of geopolitical factors around uh, global uh, struggle. So those are the three arguments, and I'll, I'll go into each of those in, in turn over the course of the talk. So what's the basis for, for these claims? Well, my, my colleague and, and co-author David Cook Martin and I, uh, with a small army of uh, graduate students, first went and gathered the laws of all 22 countries in the Western Hemisphere that have been independent since at least World War II. So this includes all of the independent countries now in the Americas, with the exception of some microstates in the Caribbean basin that became independent beginning with, with Jamaica. And we coded all of the laws of immigration for an explicit mention of some racial, national origin, other kind of, of ethnic group. So I'm happy to, to tell you in uh, the, the discussion if you have any questions about what, what any of this means. But suffice it to say for now that we're using ethnicity here as an umbrella category, uh, that the, the laws that we coded at this stage of the analysis were laws that were publicly available, whether they were in the law of immigration or the constitution or a bilateral treaty, something like this, and that we're looking at explicit mentions. So that was the, the first uh, stage. And then you know, we are aware that often there are policies that are not written in the law. We're interested in the gap between the law on the books and the law in action, which is a classical question in uh, studies of law and society. We're also interested in the ways that policies in one country would influence the policies in other countries. So we wanted to do some process tracing for how those policies developed an interaction between external influences and domestic interest groups. So we conducted case studies based on archival work in uh, the five major uh, countries of immigration over the last um, 200 years. In, in, the, in the Americas, so that's the US, Canada, Argentina, Brazil, and, and Cuba. And then we added um, Mexico as a, as a case study based on theoretical grounds. Um, the Mexican case is interesting because even though immigration to Mexico never reached more than 1% of the population foreign born back in, in 1930, Mexico had an extremely extensive s system for selecting immigrants and the discourse was of Mexico being overwhelmed by foreigners. And in that way, Mexico is very much like other countries in Latin America, which tried to attract uh, immigration en masse and, and were not successful at, uh, at doing that. The, the US case is especially important here because more immigrants went to the US during this period than the rest of these countries uh, together. Um, if you put them all together, we're talking about 92% of overseas European migration during the, the last great wave and, and most of the trans-Pacific migration as well um, from, from China and, uh, and, and Japan. Now, the US is famously uh, a nation of, of immigrants, but there are many other countries that are even more nations of immigrants. If you look at the percentage of the population foreign born, uh, starting with Argentina, which in the early 1900s was fully a third foreign born. Uh, Canada has consistently been a, a nation of immigrants to an even higher extent, about one out of five Canadians today, foreign born much higher than the US, which is 13.5%. Uh, Brazil had a little bump up to around 5%, 7% foreign born in the early 20th century. And perhaps less well known is, is the Cuban case, that by 1930, um, about a quarter of Cubans were, were foreign born as well. So th these cases are also interesting because they, they sort of decenter the idea that there's only one nation of immigrants. There are lots of nations of immigrants, and all of these 22 countries wanted to be nations of immigrants. Again, some were successful and, and, and some weren't. Now, as I mentioned, we're interested in how these policies uh, spread. And to understand processes of policy uh, diffusion, uh, 
um, transfer, learning. We conducted case studies of a set of organizations that were constituted at either a regional or a global level um, in order to understand the role that those organizations and epistemic communities of demographic experts, uh, eugenicists, later anti-racist, influence policy um, in this area. So specifically, we're looking at uh, the League of Nations, the organizations around the Pan American Union, which has changed names many different times, today called the Organization of American uh, States, OAS, um, has, has been especially important in this regard, and then of course the, the United Nations and, and various other um, assorted organizations around the UN, such as UNESCO. And because we wanted to, to write a complete um, history of, of these policies and their interaction in a way that hasn't ever been done on, on this scope, we also include in the appendix uh, potted case histories of the, the 16 other countries in the Americas that weren't the object of a, a full-blown case study. So we have the, these, these small potted histories in the end, where if you're interested in, say, in the Honduran case or the Peruvian case, uh, you, you, can, you can consult those and, and, and see the entire panorama of, of law. Okay, so what do I mean when I talk about um, selecting immigrants? So at, at the first level, we distinguish between a couple of different ways of selecting immigrants. And, and the first is positive preferences. So positive preferences might take the form as they did in Argentina in the Constitution of 1853, which said in the Constitution, Article 25 of the Constitution, that the federal government would promote European immigration. And there are other kinds of, of, of policies that provided free passage or free land, perhaps exemption from conscription or taxes, various techniques used to try to attract a particular group. The Argentine case stands out because this language is still in today's Argentine constitution, even though if you look at the actual groups that are being uh, recruited these days, uh, beginning in the 1970s, the military government began recruiting Koreans. And there has been a discussion in Argentina about whether or not the constitution needs to be changed in light of, of this. And the dominant thinking in Argentine constitutional scholarship is that really in 1853, European meant modern civilized person. And by the 1970s, who was more modern and civilized than the Koreans? Therefore, there's no need to change the constitution. So that this, is not, this is not my line of thinking, but this is what you will read um, in, in major Argentine constitutional texts. Okay, then there are also different kinds of uh, negative discrimination, obviously, uh, beginning with what you'll see on the right, the, the famous notorious Chinese Exclusion Act of, of 1882. Uh, that's how the, uh, the news was received in San Diego, where I live, so you don't just think I'm giving Stanford a hard time, where the um, <coughs> people went down to what's now a major mall, Horton uh, Plaza downtown, to celebrate the, the actions of the Democratic president. Uh, Canada a couple of years later, came up with its own head tax system, which singled out Chinese uh, for increasingly um, assessing head taxes on arrival in a way that was only done for Chinese. Many other techniques of, of negative discrimination, which might be a negative quota, it might be a special quarantine that's only used for people from a particular country, all different kinds of, of techniques of, of selection. Okay, so we're interested in both immigration uh, admissions law as well as nationality law. And in some cases, those follow the same logic, but in some cases, they follow a slightly different logic. Um, and that is because nationality is about political membership, whereas it's quite possible for countries to try to recruit immigrant workers, not because they are thought to be desirable people um, on, on the whole, but rather that they would be good human machines for some particular occupation. So to, to tease out those different tendencies, we, we separately code uh, immigration law as well as, as nationality law. Now, you know, obviously there are all kinds of policies that are not written in these black letter laws. And so in our archival work, we <laughs> spent a lot of time trying to figure out, well, what, what are the policies um, that James Scott might have called the, the so-called hidden transcripts of, of policy. And in some cases, we're able to find these hidden transcripts, and even in the case of, of Argentina and, uh, and Mexico, uncover 
uh, documents which have never been reported on in the literature either in, in Spanish or, or in English. So for example, I was doing work in the archives in Mexico City, and I found this first document here that says extremely confidential and written in <laughs> cipher. There's who knows what, followed by a set of paragraphs which refer to the people in the first paragraph. And the, the subsequent paragraphs, I'm just reproducing part of it here, there's a list of all sorts of nasty immigration measures which will be applied just to those people in the first paragraph. So I thought, you know, who are they talking about? And then I found another uh, document which says that, you know, the, the people in that first paragraph, those, those are, are Chinese, and only Chinese will be subject to these, these measures. And it turns out that Mexico had an, uh, a very extensive system of so-called confidential circulars that by the 1930s were banning the immigration of blacks, of so-called uh, Turks, of Jews, of people of the yellow race, of Abyssinians, of most of the world's population, a bunch of uh, Eastern European nationalities, um, were, were banned by these confidential circulars which didn't show up in the law. Uh, similarly, Argentina had, and, and Brazil, and Bolivia, had secret restrictions on Jews in the 1930s, um, aiming to restrict uh, Jews fleeing uh, Nazi Germany. So, you know, wherever possible, we, we tried to find these documents. We, we don't know what we don't know, but, uh, but, but we did learn a lot from, from finding these, these more subtle ways of, of, of policy making. Okay, so what are some of the, uh, the broad patterns? You know, I, I'm talking about 200 years of history, 22 countries, and uh, 40 minutes. So necessarily, I'm <laughs> the details are going to fall out. I'm, I'm happy to talk about the details during the, the Q&A here. But just to give you an, an immediate broad sense of negative discrimination in immigration law. Uh, and so this chart is showing the, um, the first year and the last year of that discrimination um, and it's, it's organized by, by total period of, of overt discrimination against at least one of these national origin or, or racial groups in the law. I should say that usually the policies were framed in terms of nationality, except for when it came to East Asian and African origin groups and they were explicitly racialized to say that you know, someone who looked um, Asian, for example, would, would be considered Asian. Um, so several things stand out here. One is how early and also how late uh, you see this kind of di explicit discrimination in the US. Um, the second is that all 22 countries had explicit ethnic discrimination in their immigration laws. This is something that we might have suspected but certainly didn't, didn't know before. And then we see some other interesting things. I mean, we see a big wave here of, of countries that all around the same time um, start putting these policies into practice, which suggests that it's not just something going on internally, there's something else external. It turns out that these are mostly at that period in the late 19th century, um, restrictions on, on Chinese, sometimes explicitly uh, so-called coolie, indentured servant labor, and sometimes more broadly Ch Chinese altogether. We also see that um, by, by this year, that none of these countries have the explicit negative discriminations anymore. So, you know, we're, we're interested in and explaining those, th those patterns. Um, what about the specific groups that, uh, that were being discriminated against? So this chart here shows you the ones that were most commonly targeted, uh, beginning with, um, with Chinese, so in the, in the blue line here. So by 1930, 18 out of the 22 countries in that, that year had explicit um, anti-Chinese restrictions. Also common, but less common, were restrictions against Japanese, and the difference has to do with a couple of things. One is that many countries considered Japan to be a source of modernity, and Japanese immigrants to be potential sources of modernity, and sometimes went back and forth between trying to restrict Japanese and actually trying to encourage Japanese immigration. Um, but more commonly, Japan was considered to be a rising world power, especially a rising uh, military power in the Pacific, and there were concerns about the implications of humili humiliating Japan, um, that that was not a safe diplomatic and military thing to do in a way that it was safe to do that vis-a-vis -vis China, which was considered to be uh, a civilization in decline during this period. Then in green here, you'll see a number of restrictions, a, a number of countries, about uh, so 12 out of the 22 countries by here, uh, had explicit restrictions against Middle Easterners. This is our own lumped category of the, the, the categories vary in the laws themselves, but 
different groups originating, originating in the Middle East. And the logic here was usually one of economic competition. It was usually one about trying to restrict people who were competing mostly in the, the small business sector. Um, so one finds this in Mexico and El Salvador and Haiti and, and, and many different um, countries. And, and, and that part can, can mostly be explained by an, a kind of an economic, a racialized economic logic in a way that some of the others can't. Um, in purple here, you see the, the number of countries discriminating against um, black or African origin populations. Also, um, you know, a, a, a very common restriction. Other, other countries we found that had uh, sort of secret documents that were systematically trying to keep out black immigrants without putting that into their black letter law, such as, as Canada, which had a whole set of policies around preventing um, or, or sharply reducing the numbers of people coming from the West Indies to Canada, um, you know, through, through the 1960s, or, or also um, African Americans moving from the U.S. to, to Canada. Um, the, the Hitano category is, is theoretically revealing, so, you know, the, the Hitano in, in Spanish, um, it's usually translated as gypsy, which of course now is considered a slur. Um, there, there are a couple of reasons why I think this is a, a theoretically important category, though. One is that you'll see at the blue line there that, that those restrictions continued a bit later than some of the other ones. So why, why, was, this, why was there this ongoing uh, open discrimination against Titanos? And I think it has to do with two things. One is that the category itself, as in English, it, mis it can mix uh, a behavioral category of sort of vagrancy, uh, panhandling on the one hand, with uh, a racial category of, of Roma. And the same ambiguity that one finds in English between a, a small g and a capital G gypsy, one finds in, in Spanish, except it's always lowercase. More importantly, there is no Hitano nation state. There is no Roma nation state to advocate on the behalf of excluded Roma. Um, and, and I think that's probably the most important reason that, that you see these, uh, these restrictions taken away quite late. And then finally, there's this category, which we didn't anticipate finding, of those were considered unassimilable here in orange. Um, I'll, I'll talk more about that, what that category means in, in a moment. Okay, so that was the negative discrimination. Then we also found um, many, many countries that had positive preferences, typically for Northwestern Europeans, which is our own lumping category. Uh, many Latin American countries had preferences for other Latin Americans or, or people from, from Spain. And What's interesting here is that one still finds a handful of countries with these, these positive preferences. So consistent with what Jopke finds in a different set of cases of rich uh, countries in the global north, even though it has kind of a politically suspicious smell about it, it's, it's still something that has some legitimacy in a way that negative discrimination does not. I mentioned briefly this idea of assimilability, and in, in many cases, assimilability, this kind of catch-all category of, of assimilability, was a way to try to exclude particular groups without saying so much in the law, um, because that didn't incur all the diplomatic costs of, of targeting specific groups. Uh, the Canadians were the, the leaders in this in 1910, uh, when they restricted the immigration of anyone considered racially unsuitable to the climate of Canada. Later, the language was uh, changed to uh, ethnically unsuitable to the climate of Canada. And this was put into the statute again in 1952. It actually wasn't taken out of the statute until 1974. As, as someone who lives in California, I'm not sure if I'm uh, suitable to the climate of Canada myself. But uh, clearly, when you go and look in the policy documents, this was meant to restrict um, Asian Indians and, uh, and people from the, the Caribbean um, and the argument was made that, well, for their own good, they're going to be kept out of Canada because it's cold on the prairie. Um, but Canada wasn't alone in this, and 11 different Latin American countries also developed policies <coughs> around this idea of selecting those who were racially assimilable. They used some slightly different language, but that was the, the idea. Um, in, this, in this graph, you can see all of the, the statutory language about assimilability. <coughs> in all cases, except for these two late ones here of, of Cuba after the revolution, and Argentina, beginning with the military government in the 70s, they, they were about racial assimilability. In those latter two cases, they were more about political assimilability, so a, kind of a, a different uh, logic. All right, so that's kind of the, the, the background here. So let's return to the, the main, three, their main three arguments. 
The first is that if you look at the way that liberalism was deployed in discussions of immigration policies, we see consistently, especially in the US, which is you know, the most liberal democratic country of, of the set consistently, um, that <clears throat> the, their argument was made that certain groups were naturally unfit to take part in the democratic life of the polity, that they were naturally unfit for self-government. And no less a luminary than John Stuart Mill wrote to the New York Tribune in the 1870s demanding the restriction, actually the end of Chinese labor immigration because he said Chinese are dangerous for American democracy. They're going to undermine uh, the free white worker. They need to be kept out. And he was not alone. He, he was expressing the, 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 the near consensus of, of the day. And Sometimes the argument was made in terms of the supposed biological characteristics of these groups, and sometimes in more of a, a sense of deep civilizational, cultural characteristics. Um, but regardless, many different groups, whether they were Chinese or Mexicans or blacks, um, were considered Catholics, were considered to be constitutionally unfit for uh, liberalism and therefore needed to be excluded. One also finds this quite strongly in the Australian case, which is not part of our set, but we did quite a bit of reading on the Australian case as well. And then when it comes to the institutions of democracy, we see recurringly, especially on the, the West Coast, where the institutions of democracy, whether it's a referenda or the, the popular vote or the free press, being mobilized by groups that wanted to restrict uh, particular racial categories from entering, and then using those, those channels to channel upward their, their demands to the federal capitals in the East. Um, so in, in California, there was actually a referendum, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was something like, I don't know, 185,000 to 10 who agreed to restrict Chinese immigration. I mean, it was the will of the people at that, at that time. We find that more broadly, thinking about um, Robert Dahl's notion of polyarchy that, that gen and general systems that um, had institutionalized venues for organized labor in particular to express its demands were very favorable to, to racial restriction as opposed to, say, uh, governments run by large landholding elites in which they were able to recruit whomever they wanted without thinking about uh, you know, the complaints of, of workers. That basically, that having a, a strong labor movement that had ways of expressing its demands upwards was bad for, for immigrants. Now, that's a picture that's obviously changed in more recent times in, in North America, but if you're looking at the broad sweep here, that is, uh, is definitely the story. And in fact, the, the main trade union in San Francisco grew up around Chinese restriction. I mean, if, if you look at California history, the, the union movement as well as the anti-Chinese movement were, were practically... Uh, practically the same. Okay, another way that we see that liberal democracy actually promoted uh, racial discrimination is that this most um, consistently liberal democratic country by any, you know, some people might disagree with that characterization, but, you know, thinking of standard measures such as the polity for, um, the, the U.S. was the main policy leader in, in, these, um, in these kinds of laws. And so was, uh, so, was, so was Canada, and people looked to both the U.S. and Canadian examples when legitimating their own, uh, their own policies. So what about the decline of this, uh, this period of ethnic selection? Was this driven by uh, what uh, Jopke and Freeman and Hayam and all of these other thinkers would have called the sort of purification of liberal democracy, where yes, there are some nasty, unfortunate examples, but they don't really sit well with uh, the, the ideas of liberal democracy. No, we find that these policies began to be taken away first in undemocratic countries in, in Latin America, and that it happened in the late 1930s. So that means you know, it, it happened a full generation before these policies were taken away in, uh, in the US and Canada, eventually later places like uh, like Australia. So in both the, the kinds of, of political systems where these policies were eroded, as well as the, um, the timing, it's very, very different from existing understandings. And I think that's, that's theoretically important. It, it wasn't until the 1962 to 1970 period in Canada that these were taken away and uh, orders in council and Canadian law. 
or in the U.S. with the end of the National Origins Act in 1965 that we see these taken away. So the U.S. and Canada were late to the game. These are processes that began in countries like Chile and Paraguay, um, Argentina and Mexico, Cuba in the late 1930s and, and early 40s. And then finally, another reason why we, we don't find it a satisfying explanation that there's something about liberal democracy that can't live with racism is that eventually, if you look at today, all of these different kinds of countries came to the same basic policy, which is no more negative, explicit negative discrimination. We can talk later about the ways that it happens more subtly, which are, which are quite important. But all of them, whether they were you know, a, a communist country such as Cuba, or a constitutional monarchy, liberal democracy, a military dictatorship, whatever they were, they came to the same policy. So there's, there's nothing particular to, to liberal democracy here. Okay, so how, how did this happen then? What was the source of this, this uh, seismic shift away from all of these countries explicitly discriminating to the situation we have today? Well, it started from below and it started in Latin America through the same organizations created by the United States to justify its various kinds of interventions in Latin America, but that over time, those same kinds of organizations were effectively deployed by countries in Latin America working in concert, um, recommending against this idea of selecting immigrants by, by race and actually saying it was a bad thing. And remember in the 1930s, it wasn't really until the 1930s that racism took on any kind of negative valence um, and in most of, of the world that most scientific thinkers simply assume that the world was divided into uh, groups of people and they were hierarchically ordered and, and that, that was race. Um, but it was, it was these countries within Latin America that did that and it wasn't because the leaders themselves were so racially enlightened. I mean, they themselves were busy discriminating against their own um, marginalized groups at, at home. Um, but they did it for a set of, of geopolitical reasons, beginning with the opening of the good neighbor policy in the 1930s. And for those of you who don't work on Latin America, remember that this was FDR's policy of, instead of practicing gunboat diplomacy, constant military interventions, multi-year occupations in places like Haiti and the Dominican Republic, of moving towards you know, more delicate kinds of intervention, using economic power, diplomatic, uh, or soft power to use a contemporary term. And in the run-up to World War II, that gave the countries of Latin America vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. than they had enjoyed before. Even by 1938, it was quite clear after the annexation of uh, Austria and the Sudetenland by, by Germany that war was on the horizon. And the U.S. was very concerned to keep its so-called backyard in the Allied camp. So this created a, a, an opening for countries in Latin America to, to demand a, a change in these policies. And we also see the, the role here of scientific organizations. I'm just picking out one here by way of example. But the, the first Inter-American Demographic Congress, which met in Mexico City in 1943, also um, recommended rejecting policies discriminating by race, which was a complete about face from the, the consensus in the 1920s. OK. so. Why, 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 so I mentioned the good neighbor policy, but why, why, why did this matter? Why, why did Latin American uh, governments use this opening to demand the end of racial restrictions in, in general, at least as, as a principle, even if they, they weren't doing it themselves always in practice? Um, in part because Latin American governments had been threatened, very explicitly threatened, we've learned, um, with inclusion in the quota acts. So you'll recall that in the 1921 and 1924 U.S. Immigration Quota Acts, there were quotas assigned to different countries uh, in terms of new immigrant visas, but independent countries in the Western Hemisphere were exempt from those quotas. But the U.S. government periodically threatened Latin American governments that if they didn't toe the line in various ways, that they would have those same quotas uh, slapped on them. There was Obviously, uh, a long-standing, large-scale Mexican migration to the U.S. Um, it wasn't simply a Mexican migration to the U.S. There was a lot of uh, immigration from other countries in Latin America to the U.S.-controlled uh, Panama Canal Zone, which was segregated along the lines of the Jim Crow South at the time. Uh, but Mexico played an especially important role here, given the large scale of its migration to the U.S. And during World War II, Mexico and the U.S. signed what became known as the Bracero Accords to send very large numbers, eventually 4.5 million contracts of, of Mexican workers to the U.S. 
Now, the Mexican government used this moment to complain about the treatment of, of Mexicans in the U.S. And it was more than a discursive move. Uh, the Mexican government would not let workers go to Texas, which was at the time the major destination for, for Mexican agricultural workers. And so the Mexican government was able to successfully pressure Washington, which then pressured Texas, to make some improvements. Certainly wasn't Shangri-La, but some improvements in the conditions of, of Mexican workers in Texas during that time. And for the first time, the Mexican government started institutionalizing so, some earlier incipient, incipient notions of anti-racism, uh, creating organs like this, uh, fraternity, um, which pointed out the, the inconsistency of, on the one hand, a joint allied effort to prosecute racist uh, fascists in Europe at the same time as uh, people were getting beat up in the United States by the virtue of, the, of, of, of being Mexican. So they, they, they very um, explicitly drew this connection between the war effort and um, and, and the grounds for, for creating a common anti-racist cause. In, in Asia, the, the Japanese government was very active at uh, pointing out something which was true to um, people in, in China, for example, um, that on the one hand, as you see in the, this is a Japanese cartoon, it's rendered in English, but it's a Japanese cartoon from the war. Um, here you see Uncle Sam breezily walking into East Asia, but when it comes to Chinese immigrants trying to get into the US, Uncle Sam says no. Open door for me and closed door for you. American immigration policy is subtle in its hypocrisy. And this had an effect. There was a wave of countries uh, around the Americas that retired their explicit anti-Chinese discriminations. So many of them were in Latin America, as you can see, in 1943, 1944. Uh, the, the US famously um, did not open Chinese immigration. It set a symbolic quota of 105, which is not very many, but it was more than, than none, going back to 1882. And, and more importantly, allowed for the first time the naturalization of, of people of, of Chinese ancestry. Um, Canada also made some moves towards opening Chinese immigration for family reunification. <laughs> it happened after the war, but definitely as a result of the war, there are a set of factors that, that explain that lag. And immediately after the war, we see a new war. We see the, the titanic struggle between the first world and the second world over the, the hearts and minds of the third. So why does this matter? This matters because for the first time, there were governments of countries of origin who were complaining in an international space about the treatment of their, their co-nationals or their perce perceived uh, co-ethnics. And it was countries in the global south which forced through all sorts of anti-racist language in the Charter of the United Nations, later in the 1948 um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that brought along the West kicking and screaming. So the United States, Great Britain, uh, Canada, Australia, they vociferously fought against any language about race in the UN because they thought, and the, for, for all of those countries, they were worried about their own explicitly racist immigration policies uh, becoming the subject of international uh, comment and diplomacy. And then in the case of the US, there was the added burden of not wanting to make uh, segregation also part of this, of, of this uh, international agenda. Um, but, but ultimately, they failed in that because various countries in the global south working in concert pushed through those, those measures. And they were successful because the support of those governments as well as their publics was needed at a time of, of titanic international struggle. So that overrode these kind of d domestic political interests in maintaining uh, racist policies. This is a story that is especially applicable in, in Canada, um, in part because it wasn't just the, the, the UN um, configuration that the Canadian government faced, but also the Commonwealth, that as uh, India and Pakistan and, and Sri Lanka became independent, they made as a condition of their membership in the Commonwealth that the other members of the Commonwealth would take away anti-Indian uh, restrictions, for example. So Nehru said India would not join the Commonwealth unless the other countries took away those restrictions. Almost immediately, you see uh, bilateral accords between Canada and India to bring in certain numbers of, of Indians. Um, and Canada used the Commonwealth to try to play a bigger role in international affairs, to, to punch above its weight, if you will, 
And it was impossible to do that and at the same time have these explicitly racist laws on the books. In the US case, yes, the civil rights movement was relevant, but this was fundamentally driven by this big geopolitical problem that the, the executive, the, the State Department and the presidency in particular had long worried, certainly going back to the, the Truman administration about what the effects were of these racist immigration policies on this global struggle with the, the Soviet Union and its allies. And in the end, we can talk about some of the institutional features of US uh, politics that, that affected the timing, but in the end, it was really these geopolitical factors that, that pushed the end of the, of the 65, um, the, the, the end of the national origins quotas in, in 65. So this, this is the story in, in, in the US case, as well as in all of these other cases that we, that we tell in, in Culling the Masses. Uh, we continue to write a couple of uh, spinoff articles based on this work, so your, your comments can not only tell us what we did wrong, but they can actually shape uh, some, some, some future publications. So with that, I will take your, your questions and comments.